Raise your hands uh, if you want to speak. Uh, you can unmute and interact with panelists. Sorry, are we good to start recording? Recording yes. in progress. All right. Donc, comme je disais, je suis vraiment... Ok, oui. Alors, comme j'ai dit, je suis bien heureux de vous voir avec nous aujourd'hui. Avant de commencer, euh, je vais faire... Uh, before we start, I'll do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that ECAPS is located on unceded indigenous, indigenous lands. The Canyon Keha Mohawk Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters which form Montreal today. The original name of this territory is Teotiake. It's historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. So before we begin, I want to thank Needs. We have Carly and Alan from Needs today, as well as Elizabeth. They helped us uh, to organize this panel, so thank you, Needs. So, Carly, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, the Accessibility Resilience uh, Program that you launched in September. Would you like to talk about that? It's a scholarship oh, uh, in not September, so December. Uh, Carly, uh, I'd like you to say a few words about this program, please. Of course, if you can. Uh First, thank you for bearing with my English, putting that aside. Uh, so NEEDS is very, very fortunate. We had our accessibility resilience program in the past. And what that did, it met the unmet financial needs of students as they transitioned to online learning. So that covered everything from like ergonomic desks to assistive technology, like captioning or even like um, adaptive technology in your browsers. And so they would send us like their receipts, we, we would reimburse them and we gave about, I believe, um, in total, including our student awards program, 104 disabled students across Canada, um, a good amount of money to meet those unmet financial needs. And we were fortunate to get our funding extended. So we are relaunching that program in December, more details to follow, um, but definitely uh, follow us on social media for any updates there. Uh, thank you. Merci, Carly. Donc uh, uh, thank you, Carly. I forgot to, to say it, but if you need interpretation to English, you can select interpretation and select uh, the language of your choice. Uh, with no further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. So Rosie, Sergeline, and Julie. I I think uh, we'll start right away. Can you introduce yourselves? So tell us where you're from, your background, your academic career, uh, if you studied in CGEP, university, etc. cetera. I have a bachelor's in psychology and human relations. Uh, from a long time ago. Uh, I worked in the field, uh, different fields uh, relating to disability. I worked at Needs, at KEPS, uh, Dawson College, etc. And during the pandemic, I decided to go back to school. It's my last year uh, for a, a second bachelor's in social work. So that's my ac academic path. Today, uh, I'm I also work for Adaptech Research Network. Speaking too fast for Jilda or the other interpreter. But I'll be back with my presentation soon. Sergeline. Hi, everyone. My name is Serge Lee Isidor. I'm currently a master's student in education at UCAM uh, with a focus on specialized training and uh, disability, uh, human rights, citizenships, and deaf, uh, hard of hearing issues. 
I've studied in uh, quote unquote regular uh, fields, uh, schools. I went to Vanyi Sijep, did a, a specialized education uh, training. I worked in that field from 2007 to 2018 in Montreal for the CSDM, CSDI, and in Ontario for DMON, the council in Ontario, school board. I am partly blind and deaf. Uh, so this was with me during my studies. Uh, they uh, affected my experience. Also, I did a certificate in uh, sociology at UCAM, bachelor's in sociology and uh, psychosocial intervention certificate and doing my master's now. <laughs> my experience as a student with disability my desire to uh, work uh, in advocacy for other students hi everyone i was born in quebec i went to cgep saint laurent I could say uh, I also did my primary school in a regular system. I have a disability. I have a vision impairment in both my eyes. This also followed me like with Sergeline during my studies. And in CGEP, I uh, did many uh, classes, but I realized that the service for people with disabilities was essential for my studies, even if in the beginning I didn't identify really as disabled, but I realized I needed that assistance. Then I did uh, human sciences in CGEP as well. I went to university, tried many things, I did a certificate in immigration and interactive interacting uh, relations. Then I did a major in sociology, a bit of social work courses at Université de Montréal as well. I uh, was very involved in uh, student uh, uh, groups. I helped uh, students, uh, people with disabilities, accompanied them with their teachers when there were issues. They had questions. I it really helped in my own um, uh, academic path to accept my disabilities. I co-founded the Sociology Undergraduate Feminist Committee, um, facilitated many events, learned a lot about myself. And now my bachelor's in sociology is complete. I will soon start a master's degree, but I, I took a semester off to really uh, think about my thesis. I did my final research about uh, women with disabilities and uh, the barriers they experienced in uh, inclusion, uh, both in school and uh, during their work uh, experiences. I'll tell you more about it later. Great. I'm so happy to have you both with me. So our three panelists have vision impairments, so it'll be really relevant to see uh, the aspect of transitions uh, between different levels of studies, um, so I forgot um, to ask participants to write in the chat who you are. Are you from an association? Are you a student, a teacher, counselor? So that we can know who our audience is a little bit. And uh, let's continue now with the next question. So you told me about your studies, your academic path. Which was the biggest obstacle that, that was the most difficult to overcome? So we can start by Julie now. 
Euh, oui, bien sûr. Ben, moi, en fait, euh, j'ai toujours été assez well, autonome d'aller voir mes... I've always been quite uh, independent, autonomous, and went to see my professors and so on. But I noticed that the organization, uh, between what the professor gives and what I need personally with the visual impairment, often I would ask the PowerPoints ahead of time in order to get organized, to enlarge them, and make them more accessible on my computer. Uh, and even the texts, we would receive the, the plans for the courses ahead of time. But then maybe they change the text uh, on Google and there's a, a difference, a gap between uh, our what we have and what they have modified. So this uh, creates a challenge for me when they're changing their plans at the last minute I think it was the, the main challenge at the university in particular, because at the CJEP, I, I found it was okay, but then at the university, there was a, a, a greater workload. And also you're, you receive less support. So the, you cannot go and see the, well, they, they cannot go and see the professors at your place because they're trying to help you out. So you have to do it by yourself. And it, it's a source of stress, I imagine. Yes, yes, a lot of stress. And I was also counting on my friends to help me out, to help me with the text, because sometimes they were even faster to give me the information uh, compared to the, the teachers themselves. So, but also I understand that the professors may, the teachers may change idea their idea, but they, they do not tell us uh, fast enough, the, those uh, changes. Sergeline? Well, I can say the main challenges were more at the technological level because with the visual impairment, it's everything that has to do with reading that was a challenge. So there was no real adaptation for the texts. Uh, often what was uh, shared or posted, whether it was a PowerPoint or other uh, things I studied when uh, the, we had slides. So it, it was very, very difficult in the, in the classroom. And often the professor uh, would forget, then we had to call him back and uh, it's, we're not always comfortable to remind the professor to be careful when you're in a group. So sometimes it was challenging, yes. But in terms of accessibility, uh, machines, photocopy machines, uh, they're not accessible. You always have to find somebody to rely on somebody else to help you out. And the uh, computers, uh, uh, sometimes uh, that there's only one, so you have to line up, or at UCAM we only have one, and we can use it uh, four times, uh, four hours, and then you have to, to, to leave. So those are, uh, those are challenges that probably a regular student wouldn't have to, to face. So, yes, it was about technology, the challenge, the adaptation of text and adapting whatever was posted on project or projected. It was difficult. Talking about technology, we'll come back to that. But I think it's going to be the, the main piece of our discussion and what we've learned from the pandemics as well. What we had before and what happened during the pandemics, there's a whole movement that was born. And today, what do we expect? Do we expect it to last or to go back to what it was before? We'll see that. So, Rosie? Well, I would say that my visual handicap was, was uh, not preventing me from uh, going on with my education. I, in general, I handled it quite well. I had major challenges when, before having a diagnostic. But at that point, the interaction with my visual handicap and the health 
issue that I had and was not diagnosed before. So the two together uh, raised the main major challenge for me. And I found it was difficult because uh, people would tell me those are the strategies to help you out. But I knew I knew those strategies I had been uh, working with that for 10 years, but I find it was difficult after the diagnosis. Once I understood that I was able to, uh, to, to function better. Thank you to the three of us. And I see that we have a lot of participants, a mother of two autistic uh, children. We have uh, persons uh, with uh, ADHD, other persons, a lot of participants of different horizons. So please do not hesitate to, to intervene. So we have candidates to doctorate. So hello, hello to everybody. So what I see in your answers is that there's a challenge at the resources level. So if you're talking obstacle, at the same time, you're talking success, success. And we saw it, you went all the way to the master doctorate. So what was your best uh, success in your work, in your education? Julie or Sergeline? So I found that the best success was to affirm myself in what I needed. It was not easy for me also because of my character. I'm very reserved. So going to see the professor and say, well, I need that for such date ahead of time. And also to learn how to negotiate, not imposing my, my view of things. Because you, well, there's you with your needs, but also the needs of the professor and his own or her own limits. So it's a matter of finding a, a balance. And through my student involvement, I was able to gradually assert myself. And uh, I was uh, the first one with, as a student with disabilities, I was the first one to get involved in the feminist committee and the, in the student association. I was the only one with uh, um, a vision impairment who was there. So I was, I was proud. I was proud to show that I was something else beside my own impairment. And also I showed that I proved that I had uh, a lot of uh, social uh, skills and other skills. So it brought me further in my, beyond even my objectives um, at school and with my, my professors. Thank you. So what I would say, well, to those who are a little bit concerned to go and see the professor, um, ask somebody to accompany you, because sometimes we don't know if we did well, but then if there's a third person, she might support you doing that. There's a question of Milan uh, to that effect. How can we be better allies as colleagues? Well, it's really asking the question to the person, what is your main need right now? Because I may think um, you need uh, you need uh, your glasses, but instead you need um, another tool, maybe. So give me several options, and I'll tell you which one I prefer. Sergeline, want to share your best uh, success, and maybe also answer to the question of Milan: How can we be better uh, colleagues and allies? Well. My best success, I would say, is, uh, well, beside my, my education uh, courses and my career as a specialized educator, success is really the, the fact to be able to give back through the organization I'm part of. For me, it's a second aspect, maybe more vocational in my career. And that's my best success. Why? Because it allows me to, to give back, to accompany other students in uh, 
a challenging situation, maybe younger ones with less experience, and to journey with them and uh, try to help them tackling the obstacles that I've took up, taken up already and helping supporting them to develop um, at the educational level and professional level. So for me, uh, it's really my, my best success being a part of that organization that I will talk about later. To respond to the question of uh, Milen, how to be a better ally. Well, first of all, leaving the proper room to the person uh, so that she or he may express himself herself so that the person can really fully participate in a teamwork in a, in whatever uh, she or he does so if it's a student taking his place or place and getting to know that person as a person and uh, listening to her to him because it's by listening to the person that we get to understand better the accompanying how to better accompany her or him so not trying to figure out at the place of the person so not taking for granted anything uh, and saying okay i'll do that or that at your place no letting the person telling you what she can do and letting her do whatever she can and supporting her in whatever she needs if she needs help uh, giving uh, the person the the aid the help she needs and also being open uh, when we have limitations in our own role of a company uh, stating those limitations so that uh, the the other person knows to what extent she can be accompanied by you thank you Sergeline. rosie For, in education, my best success would be my uh, internship, I would say, because I'm the kind of person who was um, building up confidence in herself by doing things. And uh, as I had a severe impairment, it was challenging to find jobs when I was younger. So the internship was extremely important as a step and it was hugely helpful to uh, get me find job looking for job and finding jobs i remember i wanted to be a special care counselor so social uh, aid and the person who was in charge of the program i went to, to see her to ask questions and she said well, with your impairment, I don't think it's a good idea to follow that program. It's going to be difficult for internship. And then how are you going to get a job? And 15, 10, 15 years after, I did all those things. So for me, internship was really a great opportunity to see what I could do and maybe how to do things differently, how to learn. And after that, I could focus all that experience in my, my job. And for the allies or accompanying person, um, I'm still with uh, Julie and I'm, I'm, I agree with Julie and Sergeline. I would see letting the person experience or try in as much as she can, because if she always expect uh, support, well, I'm just trying to, to put that into words. Everything that the person can do alone, giving her the chance to do it. Maybe she will learn how to, she will have to learn how to ask for help, or maybe she will have to learn how to do things alone. So we're all different. So asking, asking the question, how can I help you? What can I do to help you out? That's what I would suggest. Very, very good question. And thank you for your answers. I might repeat myself, but if you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to ask them. So what did we learn during these pandemics? 
we talked about resources much. So did you find there were changes in the resources, pedagogy or use of those resources or tools? Did you see any, any changes? Wait, were you done? What I noticed with the pandemic, with technologies, for sure, courses were on Zoom at UCAM. What that allowed me to do is that when there were shared screens, it was more accessible for me. With HDMI, I would connect my computer to the TV and, and get really close, take some time to see it. When screens are shared, uh, our technologies, however, uh, for text-to-speech, it can be too fast. But I'm so used to it, just the fact of seeing uh the image being able to get closer to it that was a great joy for me and second of all being at home and comfortable having my all my equipment uh, that i use so during the pandemic i could participate a lot more uh, prepare myself better before my courses, uh, have more questions ready. So for me, the pandemic was a great advantage for me. I liked it a lot better than courses in person. Are there things you can transfer? Like like you have said, you had a TV next to you. Of course, you can't bring your TV to school, but are there new things you can transfer now because i imagine your courses are back in person now are there things you transferred you mean of my approach of learning online to learning in person yes exactly i i don't understand what you mean by transfer adaptations so for example the technologies you are using at home is there a way that you can use these things in person or do it with an ipad i don't i don't know no there's nothing i i was able to transfer because my TV, I can't bring. I, I have one tool I could bring, but it's really, it's really heavy. So yeah, I have to get back to my previous habits of learning in person. So I'm back to how it was in the past, uh, the struggles with that. So Ariane uh, sent us a little crying uh, emoji. I think uh, she understands. Thank you, Serge Lille. Julie, is the question really to compare the before the pandemic or after the pandemic or during? So during the pandemic, what, what did you see? Did you see changes? Uh, are there new resources, uh, new teaching approaches from teachers? As Serge Lin said, the first aspect, uh, teacher, were helping with the images, seeing the PowerPoints at the same time uh, was really helpful. It's not something I was able to do before, uh, before I would only listen. So that's quite a change, destabilizing at the same time, but uh, pleasant change. However, I find that they gave us less information, less density of information. And for me, concentration is hard in front of a computer. It's hard for me to stare at a computer for a long time. So I prefer, prefer being there in person. And what I found during the pandemic uh, is that teachers would go through the PowerPoints and texts faster. That was positive and also answering your questions by email it was faster in the past it would take more time other than that 
I find that it was a little difficult because we did not have access to uh, the room for people with disabilities uh, in the UCAM library, uh, for example. I used to like going there because I could uh, study there with the tools uh, that were there. So I didn't like that. Other than that, uh, the relationship with teacher was a bit different. I don't know if it's uh, in your questions. If we have time, uh, we can talk about it later. Rosie? For me, it, everything was good, honestly. Uh, what Sergeline said, I totally agree with that. I should mention also the aspect of not just the studies, but for the first time in my life, I knew most of the students in my class. I knew their names. I could see their face a bit better. In, in a class, I'm usually really alone. I don't recognize the people unless they come and see me to introduce themselves, I don't have much contact with other students. So it was great because now when I went back after my internship to courses in person, they recognize me and it's a conversation starter. So if I do a master's, do it online because there's were many advantages for me. So on this point, Rosie, Ariane has a comment that it could be relevant that universities develop a hybrid, hybrid sort of uh, curriculum. So yeah, of course, it's uh, maybe easier in this case to create a relationship than in person. A point, I, I just want to add one thing. For support uh, service for students with disabilities, however, I, I found it was harder during the pandemic. Uh, usually when we look for the support, um, personnel, people, we go there in person. But during the pandemic, it was much harder to reach uh, people. So during the pandemic, I did not use a lot of uh, support uh, from other people because I didn't have access to it. And with technology as well, doing oral presentations, that was very difficult on Zoom uh, with the Zoom text uh, um, program I used to enlarge the screen. Uh, I, I re really, it did not go well. Okay, great, thank you. So next question, uh, more for Rosie. So, assistive technologies so we talked about zoom text zoom how, how, how should it zoom text so it's a program to enlarge the screen often these technologies are expensive are there alternatives can we replace them by free technologies Chrome extensions, for example, I know Rosie has a little presentation about this. So, Rosie? Yes. Just give me a minute to share my screen. Le timing est fantastique. On donne cette présentation-là. This is a presentation that I'm doing next week at a conference. Do you see my screen? Yes. I'll start talking. Note this because my screen is freezing. It's supposed to be enlarged, but it, it didn't enlarge. Uh, 
Est-ce qu'on peut peut-être revenir à cette question? Est-ce que c'est possible? Est-ce que je vais poser cette question plus tard? Parce que mon computer est en problème. Oui, bien sûr. So let's go back. We talked about obstacles, resources. Are there resources that can facilitate the inclusion of a blind person? So I have a real case example. I was doing a round table with a university with students with disabilities. And there was a student, it was her first semester, she was completely blind. I asked her, how do you walk around campus? Just physically, how do you get around? She said, in the beginning, I uh, have no um, places to refer to, Land benchmarks, markers, um, and it was the first semester. She, I asked her if she knew where the bathroom was, and she didn't know. She couldn't answer that. So, are there resources on the market? Have you used resources? It could uh, facilitate help in these situations to have bearings for these uh, stu students. At Université de Montréal. Uh, there were peers uh, that would help us. That really helped um, us get to know uh, the university, the campus, because it's very big. And that uh, was helpful also to visit uh, student associations that you're part of. You can create relationships there, integrate uh, the student community. And in this way, afterwards, you'll have people who can help you. You won't always have to look for people. You'll have uh, supports and also create your bearings. So I had my bearings landmarks in the university. So yeah, these if there's a peer support system and student associations. So associations, we have this in all universities, but do you know if there's this peer support system everywhere? So uh, at UCAM, I did not see that, uh, only at UDM. And what they had at UCAM, it was an association of people with disabilities uh, to help us. Uh, but uh, there weren't enough people, so it kind of disappeared. So, But I think we should bring it back uh, because it was a very useful. Because there was a peer support system uh, there. So so my experience at UDM really helped me. Okay, great. Serge Lille? Yeah, yeah. For me, uh, in integration services, I discovered a lot of things on my own. Uh, of course, they, the support system uh, explained in general, really the basics, you're allowed to get this and this, but all the rest you have to discover yourself. There was my family network, my brother, my sister, because they also were studying at UCAM. I really counted on them uh, to help with my integration. I know that for with the Ministry of Education, you uh, can have a contract to have a physical uh, person there to accompany uh, you, but you have to find the person yourself. Uh, but for me, my personal experience, it was really my family that helped. They were my greatest support. I know now that not everyone has such a network of three people studying at the same time at the same university. But I know that ENLB offers services for uh, vision impairments, uh, for to have a person to accompany you. I'd never used that service, but I know it's available. 
But for the institution itself, educational institutions, I only studied at UCAM and I really did not receive much physical support. Can I add something to that, Serge Lynn? Uh, the family is an important aspect. If there's people listening, I want them to know this. I forgot to say the same thing. My family supported during um, all my academic uh, paths. Don't be shy to ask for help. They're, they should accept us as we are. And it can help us accept our situation, whatever your situation is. I also wanted to say that I used uh, the ENLB uh, service. Uh, so people who are blind or with visual impairments, I encourage them to use it if they don't have uh, uh, family or loved ones that can support them. So use this resource. I just wanted to add that. <laughs> and, uh, just to think about that issue, what you're developing right now might really improve the situation for, for some students. Do you want to share with us your beautiful project you're developing? It's Membre Droit Educ, nonprofit organization, and the goal, the purpose of this organization is to bring together accompanying persons and uh, students with impairments so that they uh, don't have that extra workload to look for uh, help. So. Uh, the, the Department of Education is um, supporting those uh, type of initiatives, but it's not in all at, in all available in all the universities. This is uh, uh, what we see here. The platform is is being tested. So the student uh, fills out a profile. The persons who want to be uh, want to be to to, to accompany can fill out a profile as well and right now we are asked to go and explain our needs our situation in front of the class and sometimes it's challenging to speak out in a situation of vulnerability you would need to expose yourself so it's not always comfortable as a situation so in some situation i really had to take all my courage to do that but most of the time, it was my brother, my sister, my uh, who were um, helping me, who were accompanying me for academics, for even physically, and even that would take notes as well for me. Because presenting yourself in front of a classroom and sharing um, personal information about diagnosis or, or personal situation is not something that we like to do. And even a person who doesn't, have any impairment it's not it's not fun so with that platform you can do it in perfect confidentiality and the person who uh, register as a company are willing to do so so what we want to do is to form to train the students with impairments and at the same time those who accompany them so often when we have a person to accompany, is that at the beginning, the person doesn't realize the, the workload that it represents. So um, sometimes it's not that heavy. There are techniques that we may use to uh, do um, efficient accompaniment and to make it fun even. So the accompanier, can also be trained in order to accompany properly the student. Especially if it's another student, sometimes they're, they're overwhelmed with their own work and they, they then decide to stop the accompanying. So mid-session, it's necessary to find another accompanier, accompanier and it's, uh, it's difficult. Often the student will uh, go ahead alone or accept a service that is not adequate. So this platform really aims at bringing together 
the needs and uh, the offers, the services, and to make it easier for the students with impairments to um, uh, when they have to find somebody they uh, because sometimes they do not know exactly what to, they're looking for they do not know what is available so these are all the the gaps that we want to fill out as uh, with with this organization so we really want to encourage the students with impairments to carry on with their education, post-secondary, CGEP, university education, uh, even at the professional level, if that's their goal, but pursuing. Because otherwise, uh, very often, you get discouraged and you drop out. So it reminds me of the message of Julie at the beginning. Her best success story was to to take to find her courage and to go and speak out to to and speak to the teacher the professor so it's a very very interesting very good project i think ariane wanted to share her own experience we only have nine minutes left but yes please go ahead ariane I'll be sharing my experience because i have an impairment that is a little bit different so it will broaden up our vision. I have uh, cerebral palsy since I was born, so everything for me is more tiring. It takes more energy of me. And uh, with this type of uh, impairment, you're more exposed to depression and anxiety later on in life, especially if you're not aware of the transportation, uh, adapted transportation services. I, I really had to hit a wall with a major depression to the, then uh, register to a, a training. So I just wanted to uh, share how Mon Bras Droit Educ helped me. First of all, it helped me to find uh, an accompanier who was able to, to respond to, to my needs. And he had a similar background in literature. And it was interesting because as many of the panelists said, it was interesting to be able to express my own needs without being judged. Because I have an impairment, but the main issue that I have with my education is anxiety. So my accompanier is able to be present during those moments. So sometimes when we, I'm three days or a few hours before handing back my work, as he's aware that it's something that may happen, it, it makes himself available to uh, support me. So that was a very a precious help and a priceless help. And since then, I really improved my, my academic results. And it's extremely helpful, as it was said. Those persons are well-trained, and um, they're well-trained to the different uh, challenges that comes with an impairment. So. This is my, my own uh, testimony. This is what I wanted to, to share with you. It's a service that I appreciate much. So, and congratulations for your success. So we have a uh, few minutes left, seven minutes left. Maybe you should have planned an hour and a half meeting. But Rosie, maybe we could come back to the question if... Oh, okay, it's just that I cannot share my screen anymore. I apologize, but my computer stopped uh, collaborating, so I don't have my, my PowerPoint. Uh, I'll try again. Yes. I just wanted to say that we know there are many reasons uh, why the students uh, with impairments do not use technologies, especially because of the costs. We have English slides. Um, Jilda, are we good? Can I, can I go? If you have need to change the interpretation for the French. Okay. I can start. Okay. Thank you. So, Starting over, um, 
So Adaptive is looking into the different ways that assistive technology could be done uh, differently, whether Chrome extensions can be differently. And the reason for this, it's driving me crazy that I cannot bring this in full view, but anyhow. So the reason for this is because uh, we know that lack of training, uh, fear of stigma and standing out and cost are reasons that many students with disabilities do not use assistive technology. So we looked into Chrome extensions. Um, pardon me. We looked into Chrome extensions and basically Chrome extensions are little itty bitty or larger pieces of technology that are attached to your Chrome browser that will either change the way your browser works or attach a specific feature on it, another service like, for instance, Grammarly. So, um, I'm going to just go to the very end because of time. So, um, so there are Chrome extensions. Okay, so there are Chrome extensions that are for reading, writing, note taking, um, uh, productivity, and then there are some that are more disability specific, uh, such as for hearing uh, or captions, for instance. So there are a lot of them. Um, here's what our thoughts are, my thoughts are, in terms of having tested many of them uh, who I think could or could not benefit from these technologies. So the advantage to using, this is to using Chrome extensions is that um, people who are hesitant to use assistive technology because of price or because of standing out could benefit because these technologies are often made for mainstream consumption. So it's not reliant on having a disability. It's not reliant on having a diagnosis or getting funding or getting training. Anybody can access them and they're not in general, they're not cost prohibitive. So obviously like that depends on your budget but there are free options that are limited but they're there. Um, so I will say that they are, um, the, the advantage, sorry, so those who, who would want to consider them either have to have a little bit of, of, of experience using technology or just not be afraid of, um, you know, trying different ones and, and seeing what works and what doesn't and not get flustered by that process. So in terms of in terms of those who, who might not want to consider using assistive using Chrome extensions for assistive technology, it's somebody who is already using a program that works uh, and who doesn't want to look into something else because they already have what works for them. Somebody that has kind of more complicated or complex needs. So you have, for instance, a literacy tool and you're using multiple different things in that tool. Um, it is possible to find comprehensive extensions or different extensions for different tools, different things, but it could be a bit more complicated. If you want one-on-one -on -one training from let's say your university uh, office, then you probably are gonna be more, you know, push towards something else that's more comprehensive. Um, if you're anxious about using technology or if you're using a screen reader, so, in theory, these extensions could be made accessible, um, but it's, we're not there yet. And there's not really anything about, about that yet. So this is, even though they've been around for almost a decade, uh, this is kind of new and not really spoken about. So there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot you can do with them, um, but it needs some, some testing, some trying, and Adaptech is working on that. We have uh, our free and cheap, uh, no, pardon me, we have Fandy, which is basically a download section that allows you to kind of look into options that are more affordable. And so that's a project we're doing is testing a whole bunch of them so that nobody has to do all this testing. Um, so that's in progress. So 
That was the very Cliff Notes version. Uh, I hope in five minutes or less about what is, is um, a, a browser extension, a Chrome extension, and whether or not they could be useful as assistive technology devices or assistive technology. Merci, um, Rosie. D'ailleurs, s'il y a des gens... Thank you, Rosie. And you said if there are persons who want to test, Adaptec has a, has a list. Well, Adaptec can offer a list, but we're compiling now a list of extensions. It's, it's rather a long-term project, but presently we have a, a few that we've tested. We're undergoing, we're, they're undergoing tests. So the idea is that uh, you don't have to test 10 tools to read text on the screen, for example. So we do the testing to sort out what uh, do the best job. So this is what we're doing, trying to see how we can validate information and make recommendation con consequently so that the students do not have to do that work on their own. But it's undergoing. It's an ongoing work. Very interesting. So it's already one o'clock. Uh, the event was supposed to be one hour. If you have some qu quick questions before we end, uh, you can ask them now. If not, thank you for being here. Thank you to the interpreter, the captioner's needs, Carly Allen. Thank you so much. It's always appreciated to have your support. Carly, do you have something? No? I do if there's time, just really quickly. Um, sorry. Needs general meeting is coming up on the 27th. It will be a bilingual conference. Uh, it's from the 27th from 1 p.m. to 4.30. We're featuring um, discussions from, you know, on-campus disabled student leaders, as well as our staff and some board members and community partners, including AKIPS. So definitely worth showing up. Thank you. Merci. D'ailleurs, ça me fait penser. Thank you. That reminds me, ACAPS la just launched its scholarship uh, program, a cross disability uh, program. Uh, everyone with a disability uh, is um, uh, eligible. My colleague uh, did share the link. Uh, so very relevant for people with disabilities. Again, thank you everyone for being here. It was great to see your, to hear about your stories, your successes. So thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you, Yannick. Yes, and I just want to share the email address, uh, the web address of Mon Bras Droit et Deux. Uh, Jilda put it in the chat. If you have questions, you can also ask them on the website or on the Facebook page. Caroline, uh, Caroline in the chat is saying thank you. Thank you for being here, Caroline. And good luck, everyone, uh, during your academic career. I wish you Lots of success. Ariane sent you a little heart emoji. Oh, Julie, Sergeline, Rosie, you can stay. Alan. Please. Recording stopped. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.